Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to the proof that Islam is the truth. And here over these series, we've been trying to show you the evidences through which and by which a rational, intelligent human being could know that Islam truly is the revelation from Allah, the creator of the heavens and the earth, for the benefit and for the mercy of all of humanity. And today we're going to be talking about some of the amazing historical facts that we can find in the Qur'an. Let's remind ourselves, of course, that the Qur'an is a book 1,400 years old. Muslims believe it was revealed by God, the creator of the heavens and the earth. Allah is the Arabic name for God. The one God, the creator, the all-knowing, the all-wise. So it's not surprising to us as Muslims that the Qur'an should be accurate and should be consistent because it is revealed by the one who is the most all-knowing, who is the all-knowing and who is the wise. So of course, it's natural, it's normal for us, we'd expect it to be accurate and be consistent. But of course, for people today, and many people are claiming they don't believe that there's a God, or they don't believe that God sends us guidance and revelation, it remains a challenge to you. And it remains a sign, a great sign, a proof and evidence that Every Muslim through it and by it gets more certainty and gets more sure that the Qur'an is indeed what it claims to be, the revelation from the mighty, the wise. And so let's talk about some of those historical facts in the Qur'an. Now, first of all, um, there is a story in the Qur'an about a great prophet of God called Noah. And this prophet is also, of course, mentioned in the Bible. And I'm sure you all know the story of Noah how God sent Noah to his people, and the people of Noah refused to believe in him. And because of that, God sent upon them a flood. Now, before that flood, God told Noah to build an ark. Now, there's a few things about the story of Noah in the Qur'an. One of the things that's worth mentioning is in the 11th surah, or 11th chapter of the Qur'an, in the 44th ayah, the Qur'an mentions that the ark that's the boat that Noah built, came to rest upon Mount Judi, Istawa Judi. Istawa came to rest upon the mountain of Judi. Now, the Qur'an is mentioning a specific name of the mountain where the ark of Noah came to rest. And it's very interesting that recent archaeological research around the area of Mount Judi, in fact, there is a Mount Judy in Turkey, in present-day Turkey. And on this Mount Judy, there is a boat-shaped object with exactly the same dimensions as the Ark of Noah. Now, the Bible claims that the Ark came to rest on Mount Ararat, which is, in fact, 20 miles away from Mount Judy. And there's a few problems with the biblical description. The first problem is that... The mountains of Ararat, or the Mount Ararat itself, is a relatively recent geological formation. If we look at the time scale, when the Ark of Noah was supposed to be around, the Mount Ararat did not actually exist at that time. It is very recent geological formation. So that's one problem. And also, the dates and the times offered in the Bible flood and also the claim that in the Bible that the flood was a universal cataclysm. They don't fit the present day archaeological and scientific findings. First of all, of course, in scientific terms, the idea that it could rain for 40 days and 40 nights constantly upon the Earth's surface is scientifically not viable. Of course, Anyone could explain that by saying it was a miracle of God, it was an exception. Of course, we cannot argue that God has the ability and the power to do that. But what we are saying is that in scientific terms, for it to rain for 40 days and 40 nights, it's not possible. As anybody who knows how the water cycle works, the sun heats up the earth's surface, heats up the sea, and the vapor from the sea is what is transformed into clouds, and the clouds are then transformed into rain. Now, of course, if it is cloudy all over the Earth's surface because of the rain, then how can the sun heat up the sea in order to produce more rain? 
All I'm pointing out here is that scientifically it's not viable. Also, there is simply a not water, enough water on this planet in order to raise the sea level so high uh, that, as according to the Bible, every single mountain peak was covered. Since Everest is the highest mountain peak today, and it still was then, uh, the amount of water that would be needed in order to raise the sea level above the level of Mount Everest is more than there is water on this planet in order to do that. Again, we're not denying that God could do it if he wants to. All we're saying is that in scientific terms, it's very difficult to verify such a claim that the Bible makes. However, the Quran does not claim that the flood of Noah was a universal worldwide cataclysm. In fact, the Quran clearly refers to the punishment that is bestowed upon Noah and his people as being something that is specific to Noah and his people. Uh, and so although we don't have any geological evidence for a universal cataclysm, we do of course have plenty of geological evidence for local cataclysmic floods. So this is very interesting that the Quran first of all accurately points out that the ark came to rest on Mount Judy and it seems that there is a very very high probability that the bolt shaped object and surveys have been done of it is the remnants of a massive bolt. And where is it found on Mount Judy as the Quran says? As for looking for the ark on Mount Ararat people have searched in vain for years and years and found nothing. Bible describes a cataclysmic, universal, worldwide event, whereas the Qur'an describes it as a local event. Again, what we find here is that the Qur'an is in agreement with archaeological and scientific data. It's perfectly acceptable and it's viable and verifiable according to that. Let's go to Egypt and look for some more amazing historical facts. The Qur'an mentions the story of Joseph and Noah and the Bani Israel, the children of Israel. Of course, Muslims believe that Joseph, or Yusuf, as he is mentioned in the Quran, was a prophet of God. Muslims also believe that Musa, or Moses, may peace, God's peace and blessings be upon both of them, was also a prophet of God. And their stories are mentioned in the Quran by way of a reminder, by way of a teaching to us, and that is, of course, the main purpose of the Qur'an is to be a moral guideline. It's to show us how we should live and how we should behave in our life. But yet, when the Qur'an is talking about historical data, what we find again and again that it proves to be accurate. And there are some accuracies, telling little accuracies, that actually, if one thinks about it, are truly remarkable. And it stands as a challenge to the human intellect. How does this information come to be so remarkably accurate in the Qur'an? From where was the Prophet Muhammad gathering this information? A man who was himself illiterate, who could not read, who could not write. He didn't go to university. They didn't have Egyptology as a field of study at that time. The knowledge of hieroglyphs was lost hundreds and hundreds of years before the time of the Prophet Muhammad. So how come? When the Qur'an mentions about Joseph, Joseph refers to the leader of the Egyptian people at the time as king. The term Pharaoh or Pharaon is not mentioned in relation to Joseph and the ruler of Egypt. It is mentioned in relation to Moses and the ruler of Egypt and Moses calls the ruler of Egypt Pharaon. But Joseph does not call the ruler with whom he is interacting and who he acts as an advisor and a guide. He doesn't call him Pharaoh, he calls him king. And we're going to talk about why and how that is a remarkable historical accuracy after the break. Don't go away. Join us for the next part of the proof that Islam is the truth. Amazing historical statements in the Quran.